This is a video about women in the civil service celebrating the past, present and future of our contribution to public life. Women were first hired by the civil service in 1870. Employed as telegraphists in the post office, these women had to be middle class, had to be unmarried and were strictly segregated from the men. A married woman who is not a widow is not eligible for any appointment in the general post office. Any single women now established who marries will be required to resign. Eventually, the Treasury created a class for women typists in 1894. However, women had to endure segregation and unequal pay, as the Royal Commission on the Civil Service Report demonstrates. Women should be fixed on a lower scale than those of men, and female clerks, where employed, should be accommodated separately from male clerks. World War I was a turning point for women in the workforce. With men away fighting, women stepped up to support the war effort to keep the country running. In 1911, 33,000 women were working in the civil service. Ten years later, this had more than tripled. The war revolutionised the industrial position of women. It found them serfs and left them free. The government acknowledged women's contribution to the war effort by passing the historic Representation of the People Act in 1918. So Vicky, this is it. This is the Representation of the People Act 1918 um, that allowed women to vote for the first time, right in front of us. Yes, this is it. This is what all those women and men were campaigning for, um, although it is obviously partial reform. Um, so ultimately, I think frustrating for many, many people who would have um, campaigned as part of the suffrage movement actually wouldn't have been rewarded with the vote ultimately. Yes, yeah, so tell me, who was eligible under this act to vote? So essentially the main uh, qualification is that they're uh, 30 years old, um, but there are also additional qualifications that go alongside that. Uh, so property qualifications, um, the need to be registered um, as a local government elector or be married to someone who was, um, and even a, a university clause as well. Um, so it's, it's quite complex and actually it enfranchises millions of women, um, but is still relatively um, small reform in, in terms of equal rights. Despite these important achievements, the general public was still resistant to women working in male-dominated fields especially when men started returning to work after the war. This included women such as Isabel Paisy. No decent man will allow his wife to work and no decent woman will take the work away from single women and widows currently looking for work. This negative attitude extended to the civil service who banned all married women from applying for government jobs and required women to resign upon marriage. This was known as the marriage bar. The 1919 Sex uh, Disqualification Removal Act uh, removed some of those barriers of the marriage bar for some professions, um, but it maintained until 1946 in the civil service. Um, so essentially you had to be single or widowed to work in the civil service as a woman. Right, so I wonder if many women chose between their career or their marriage. I don't know. You, you get a sense that uh, some women are really pulled um, by it. Uh, there was a waiver available for some women, but it was a very small number. Um, so, so you do sometimes see arguments in, in some of our documents um, where women do want to get married and have a career, um, but it's relatively rare um, that those cases actually come through. Just as World War I had advanced women's right to vote, the Second World War was pivotal in bringing more women, including those who were married, into the workplace. By 1938, 80,000 women were employed by state departments and recruited on the same basis as men. And in 1946, the Home Office made the progressive decision to lift the marriage bar, with all government departments following suit over the next 30 years. Of course, sexist attitudes still prevailed. So naturally, their homes would come first to them, so they would feel it was their duty if their children or indeed their husbands were ill to go home and look after them. Although many women did stop work to look after the family, some women were beginning to climb to the higher echelons of the civil service. So Evelyn Sharp was a really prominent woman in the civil service, so she's actually the first woman to become a permanent secretary. Uh, for the Ministry of Housing and Local Government. Um, so that's in 1955, but what we have here is her application form uh, to join the administrative grades in the civil service. Um, and I think it shows that just the form in general, the context of how women were kind of battling an establishment that wasn't really necessarily ready for them or prepared for them maybe. Um, and we can see that just in the some of the simple things from the form here. Um, 
mark six on the application uh, form says states whether you're a, uh, you're single or a widow. Um, obviously, that that question wasn't relevant to men. It, it's outlined here as being for female candidates. A significant step was taken in 1961 when equal pay was introduced to the civil service, preceding the wider Equal Pay Act by nine years. Indeed, by the 1970s, the civil service was recognised as providing one of the best careers to women at the time. Today, the civil service is more female than male, and the number of women in the senior civil service continues to rise. As more women enjoy successful careers, Melanie Dawes explains what more we need to do to ensure our workforce is as diverse as possible across all grades. We've made great strides on gender equality in the civil service in the last 20 years through things like maternity leave, better flexible working, and by scrubbing down all our processes on recruitment, promotion and development, we've made a big difference. And we should be proud of where we've got to. With nearly 43% of the senior civil service made up of women, we do better than most other countries and far better than a lot of private sector companies. But there's still a lot more to do. I think the focus right now should be on really understanding the day-to-day -day experience of women in the civil service and getting on the table some of the stereotypes, behaviours and cultures that can still hold women back, things that have been the norm for too long and which we do need to address if we're going to keep moving forward. I'm really confident that we will carry on improving and that we're going to carry on making the civil service the kind of inclusive 21st century employer that we all want, creating even more opportunity for amazing women like these. I'm Ruth Lawson, I'm Head of the Basic Services Group at the Department for International Development in Pakistan. I'm Andrea Prophet and I'm Head of the Trade Statistics Unit. I'm Kit, I work for the Department of Work and Pensions. I'm Claire Moriarty, I'm the Permanent Secretary for the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. My name is Mems and I currently work in Parliament. I'm Harriet Smith, Head of International Trade at the Department for Exiting the EU. I'm Emma Howard Boyd and I'm Chair of the Environment Agency. I'm Alice Bunn and I'm International Director at the UK Space Agency. I am Sangeeta Thapa. I am our driver at DFID Nepal. I'm Bex Buckingham and I'm the Head of Office for the Department for International Development here in South Sudan. I'm Kim Munro and I'm an Inspector with the Health and Safety Executive. I'm Kate Davies and I'm a Liaison Officer for the National Crime Agency in Paris. And I am proud of the women who have gone before me to make the civil service what it is today.